Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, publicly uh, ad addressing the rumors that he kind of got going, that the International Criminal Court uh, may uh, launch charges against him and senior leaders of uh, Israel for war crimes. Let's roll Netanyahu here. The International Criminal Court in The Hague is contemplating issuing arrest warrants against senior Israeli government and military officials as war criminals. This would be an outrage of historic proportions. International bodies like the ICC arose in the wake of the Holocaust committed against the Jewish people. They were set up to prevent such horrors, to prevent future genocides. Yet now, the international court is trying to put Israel in the dock. It's trying to put us in the dock as we defend ourselves against genocidal terrorists and regimes, Iran, of course, that openly works to destroy the one and only Jewish state. Branding Israel's leaders and soldiers as war criminals will pour jet fuel on the fires of anti-Semitism, those fires that are already raging on the campuses of America and across capitals around the world. It will also be the first time that a democratic country fighting for its life according to the rules of war is itself accused of war crimes. The Israeli army, the IDF, is one of the most moral militaries in the world. It takes endless measures to protect civilians. We've, we've, heard, we've heard that before. Uh, so the, Netanyahu pressured the U.S. to come out publicly and defend Israel against the rumors that Israel appears to have started itself, uh, that the ICC was coming at them, and, and the White House did. The White House said, we do not believe that the ICC has jurisdiction over uh, Israel. Their argument they're, they're making is that Israel has not signed on to the ICC uh, itself. However, the Palestinians have. And when the ICC launched charges against Vladimir Putin, the U.S. applauded those charges. Russia is mm -hmm. not a signatory to the ICC, but mm -hmm. Ukraine is. And that is why the ICC has jurisdiction. If you are committing a crime against a member, a signatory of the ICC, then the ICC has jurisdiction, whether you're a signatory or not. That was the principle that the White House believed when the ICC charged Putin. All of a sudden, that doesn't apply uh, any anymore in this case. Not long after the U.S. gave Netanyahu the assurance that he wanted, Netanyahu came out and said that even if he cuts a hostage deal uh, with Hamas, he is still going to launch an invasion into Rafah. It's very interesting to hear Netanyahu alluding to these sort of international rules that were largely agreed upon in the wake of the mm -hmm. Holocaust, and he referenced that directly. Um, and to see the way that they are used selectively and as blunt force objects. I mean, it is exactly true that we all, we've talked about this many times. We came together after World War II, after the Holocaust, the level of industrial slaughter uh, the world had never seen and said, this is, and, and that's, you know, includes things like Dresden and nuclear weapons. Um, we came together and said they're, th this, this is not sustainable for humanity. Mm -hmm. And these are the, the new sort of ethical. Ever again. Yeah, right. And these are the, the ethical guidelines that we'll look to going forward. And we agree with them when we want to agree with them, when it's a blunt force, force object that we can use against enemies for the sake of our own foreign policy goals. And then uh, we say, well, those are non-binding or nobody signed on to that or whatever. Um, it's just the sanctimony uh, that goes behind the United States and its allies in the West uh, wielding them, not just like the, the Putin thing is such a good example. I mean, it was just the, the, the level of credibility we assigned to it when we right. wanted to use it there. I mean, that's as good an example as you can get. Yeah, so much for the rules-based uh, international order. Uh, meanwhile, there's, there's reporting, if we can put up this uh, next element, uh, that the U.S. is contemplating accepting significant numbers of Palestinian uh, refugees uh, who, are, who are trying to flee Gaza. And what's, what's fascinating about uh, this news is that, you know, for the most part, uh, we, we have accepted very few dozens of, of Palestinian refugees mm -hmm. over the years. And when we have, uh, it's, it is refugees who are claiming political asylum uh, from Hamas. Yeah. And Hamas is uh, a, a vindictive organization toward its critics, absolutely. And yeah. so uh, people who are kind of dissidents again and, and critics of Hamas like ha have 
some have been legitimately granted refugee status here in the United States. Not many. Like, not many, yeah. like dozens. Yeah, um, no, I, I pulled the numbers last night. It's actually kind of shocking. Like 60-something, so, or what is it? Last 10 years, U.S. has resettled more than 400,000 refugees from CVS, mm-hmm. CBS uh, fleeing violence. And in 2023... 56 Palestinian refugees, so that was 0.09% right. of 60,000 refugees in that 12-month period. Right, and so in order to in order to boost that number up to the number of people who need ac- actual uh, safe havens at this point, what the U.S. would have to do is grant them asylum basically from themselves, because they would have to grant them asylum from Israel. Mm-hmm from the IDF, from the military campaign. They need Egypt's cooperation. Against them. Well, they would need, but but le- the legal rationale for accepting this many refugees from Gaza would be that they are uh, persecuted by Israel. And we are supplying the weapons and the political support and the global, inter- the global support for that very persecution, which we are then going to give asylum against. So we'll be giving them asylum in our country against ourselves, basically. Yeah, we talk about this when we talk about the border. So uh, asylum is actually a much more narrow category than it's often used. Um, And then it's been used in our southern border in particular. So you have to prove that you're being targeted based on your nationality, religion, or your political views. And so you can see pretty easily how that argument can be made. And you can pull a million quotes from uh, Israeli government on this point uh, and and talk about what's happened, you know, in your community in Gaza when you're applying for asylum. Now, they absolutely could still use Hamas. um, And, you know, they could, that could be the rationale that a lot of them give. um, But they could also, you can see, start making an argument in the other direction. And it reminds me actually, Ryan, of how the U.S. sanctioned that unit of the IDF recently. Is like it's the same sort of strange circular yeah. uh, logic. And it, it, listen, if people as refugees are coming to the United States and they want to be citizens of the United States, that's great. Um, I think that's awesome. There's public polling uh, out of Palestine uh, that suggests a big chunk of the population there, and polling is is tough there. But this is from the Palestinian Center for Policy and Survey Research in December. 72% of Palestinians, quote, believe that Hamas's decision to launch the October 7th attack was correct. Now, again, we can debate what that means, um, but it definitely means fundamental disagreement with U.S. foreign policy, and you can understand why people in Palestine would have a very uh, hostile approach towards United or perspective towards United States uh, foreign policy. So, does this, you know, sow discord in communities? I don't know that enough people will be accepted that it'll sow discord around communities. To be honest, of 56 in 2023, that was one of the most violent recent years on record mm-hmm. um, in Palestine, and so. And that's what a lot of people on the right are worried about. You know, we're going to import right. a bunch of people who hate America. I don't know that they're going to be able to get enough people out that that becomes a problem, to be honest. Yeah, and the Israeli government's, uh, you know, put out a lot of white papers and other and, and trial balloons showing that their the plan was to depopulate, you know, Gaza going in. And yeah. so, yeah. on the one hand, um, this this plays into the effort to ethnically cleanse uh, the Gaza Strip of Palestinians and then and rebuild it. As Israelis on, as Jared Kushner said, you know, uh, waterfront, waterfront property. Um, Maybe they'll use Kushner's quote. There you go. In their asylum applications. At at, at the same time, the area is going to be uninhabitable for many years. It's the north, northern Gaza, for instance. um, You know, so a normal bomb ordinance getting dropped from uh, a plane in a battlefield or fired elsewhere has something like a ten percent failure rate. Mm-hmm. Israel does not use these weapons normally. You know, they're they're dropping them yeah. in areas where they're going to have a much higher failure rate. Yeah. And so maybe you're pushing 20% failure rate. And you're talking of you know thousands and thousands of bombs being dropped on on Gaza. Those are fairly stable, unexploded ordnance until they are disrupted by a bulldozer or some type of construction during a rebuilding process. The the it's impossible to overstate how time consuming it is to extract these weapons. Uh, in Northwest Washington, D.C., where they did um, where they did basically chemical weapons testing during World War I, <laughs> right. they are still, to this day, finding unexploded like mustard gas ordinances in Washington, D.C., near American University, mm-hmm. uh, where, that, where that research was carried out more than 100 years later. And so uh, it's just going to be borderline impossible for hundreds of thousands of people to return uh, to to their homes um, any anytime soon, 
which means they're going to have to live somewhere. And just before we wrap, let's put this poll up on the screen. Uh, this is reporting in the Jerusalem Post about a new poll published by N12. Over half of the Israeli public believes that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu should resign immediately, including 28% of those who voted for the bloc that supports Netanyahu. 48% uh, of Israelis believe Defense Minister Gallant should resign immediately. Wow. I mean, like, if you keep going down the line here, uh, there's, you know, 50% believe the IDF chief of staff should resign. 56% believe uh, that the head of Shin Bet should resign right now. I mean, 54% of respondents said that the elections should be held earlier. So that's not just opposition to Netanyahu. That's immediate, urgent opposition to Netanyahu. And obviously in Israel, there's opposition from, uh, like, both sides. So people who are, you know, more hardcore that want, you know, Netanyahu to go even harder uh, than he has gone. And then there are people who disagree that, you know, think he's already gone too far and then he's been, you know, mismanaging the situations and incompetent. Uh, but all that is to say, this yeah. is a pretty untenable situation for Netanyahu and his coalition at the moment in Israel. It's been a strategic failure in every sense of the word, world, word up and down. Uh, from Netanyahu and his managing of the conflict before and after October 7th. Yeah, and the Israeli public uh, is picking up on that, no doubt about it. Hey, if you liked that video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to Breaking Points. If you want to see the rest of CounterPoints, go to breakingpoints.com to become a premium member and get the full uncut show every morning in your inbox and on Spotify. Help us build independent news and get the full show every morning at breakingpoints.com.